Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Yes, I'm ready for the event. ABC News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is David Curley of ABC News. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, David. Dr. Whitson, it's a pleasure to see you again. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Space is a great place to be. You know, uh, we're going to talk about the record. You will be the longest serving American in space. What does that mean? And, and is it really more of what you're feeling with the effects, the science that you're conducting, or is it the record? Well, I'm definitely here for conducting the science, having the opportunity to live here, uh, work here. It's a huge privilege. So it's not, I'm not here because of the record. But I, I think having the record is important for NASA um, and because we have to continue to progress. We have to continue to take the next steps in order for us in the future in exploration going to Mars, we have to understand how the body reacts, how our hardware reacts, what things work well in space, what things don't. We want to answer all those questions before we begin those uh, many multi-year missions. It, it, we need to know those things now. We have seen a lot of movies, we've heard a lot of talk, uh, a lot of discussion about Mars. Are we going to Mars? Are we going to go? I absolutely believe we will. I, and the sooner the better, I think. This, the space station serves as a really important stepping stone to get us there, I think. Um, l let's talk about some of the effects. Uh, there, there's worry about a Mars trip, about radiation, what it does to your body, bone density. Um, can you be honest with this? Can you be candid? Have you felt anything so far in your time in space that has changed in your body? Actually, uh, one of the things that I noticed, particularly after my second flight, my second six month stay, was I felt like my hip flexors had uh, shortened up. And so I've spent a lot more time stretching this time. And the reason that happens is in space, uh, your natural uh, body position is much more relaxed. And so it tends to tighten the, the hip flexors a bit. And in my opinion, that's what caused um, me to have more back pain after I got back after my second flight. And so this time I'm spending a lot more time stretching those muscles and flexors so that uh, hopefully I won't have that same sensation when I go back. Scott Kelly talked a bit about when he got back, uh, the rubbing on the skin and the irritation that he was feeling. We haven't seen all the studies of the medical data that was taken between him and his twin, Mark. Um, but I'm coming back to the Mars question. Because of all that, are we built to go to Mars? Can our body sustain that as a biomedical person? You're probably one of the best people to ask that question to. Yeah, actually, I think we will get there. Uh, we still have some critical questions to answer. But for instance, the bone mineral density issue that we've been plagued with for many years you know, we lose, if we don't do anything to counteract the effects of the bone loss, we lose more than, say, a geriatric woman in a year, and we lose that in a month. So it's pretty dramatic if we don't do something to counteract those effects. And we found the right exercises uh, that seem to minimize uh, those effects, and at the same time, that also helps us maintain muscle mass, uh, which was muscle atrophy was another problem. So we are getting there. I think the biggest hurdle probably for the human body is going to be the radiation that you talked about. And uh, probably the easiest solution is to get there faster uh, so that you take less risk along the way. 
So we, we'll have to look at maybe some of those new engines to get us there faster. But at the same time, we know we can survive it. Uh, we just may have to develop different mitigation strategies uh, to survive, for instance, a solar particle event that uh, otherwise might be pretty detrimental to us. I just had lunch a couple of minutes ago, and I was thinking about you. I was having some cucumbers, and there were some onions in there, and I thought, I take for granted, we all take for granted that I can get fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. What have you missed the most so far? Well, definitely, I, I do miss the fresh fruit and the vegetables. When we have cargo vehicles um, come up, they bring up apples and uh, oranges, and that's really great to have as a supplement. But, of course, on a Mars mission, we're not going to have that. This time, I'm also growing, uh, I've grown cabbage a couple of times. I've just started my second, second uh, growth of cabbage. And uh, we harvest half of it for science, and then half of it we get to eat, which is great because it's just amazing what a little bit of, of uh, lettuce, uh, and I make up some tuna salad with some horseradish sauce in it, and we have that as an appetizer. It's just amazing when you're eating everything out of uh, a pouch or a bag that uh, having something real uh, tastes so dramatically different. So I think for future long duration missions, you know, going to Mars, uh, we are gonna need that capability to grow uh, some of our own fruits and vegetables probably at least vegetables anyway. So here's the, the deep question. A lot's going on down here on the planet. Um, there was a, a big bombing in Afghanistan today. There was worry about North Korea. All these things are going on down here. You're up. I know you're getting the news. But when you look down at Earth from the station and you think about the troubles we're having here, does it give you any different perspective? I think just seeing our Earth from this perspective is uh, uh, very eye-opening, very dramatic. I think we need to do more to be one, one Earth, one people. And I asked Scott Kelly this question when he was up there. Uh, I'll ask you the same question. Is there one spot that you look down on that just really gives you the chills, a, a piece of geography of the planet that actually touches you every time you go over it? Well, actually, I think it's very interesting to see the same spot that you might have seen many times, but the, the sun angle will be different. You'll see something new that you didn't see the time before, um, you know, glint, sun glint off of water. There are all these neat features that keep it changing. So even though there's some uniqueness about every spot on Earth, uh, every time you see it, it's even more unique. You see something new or you see something from a different angle or different light lighting that makes it look different. So it's just very, very special. If I had to pick one spot, um, I don't know. I I'm, I'm really impressed with northern Africa and the colors. It's just such a warm color coming off the sands of the desert there. Uh, and it, it's just amazing, the colors. And then the, the formations of the sand and uh, the, the geographical structures there, I think, is very uh, interesting. Of course, I also really love the Caribbean, all the blues, uh, really amazing blues in the Caribbean are, are very dramatic as well. So it's, it's hard to pick one spot. I love Australia and the reds and the earth. So just, it's all really neat. I think we have less than 30 seconds. What would you like to say to our viewers that we never ask you about? Is there something you'd like to say that we never ask you? I don't know. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, but um, I, I, I wish I was more articulate about how special living in space is. Dr. Whitson, a pleasure again to speak to you, this time all the way up at the station. Thank you very much, and good luck with the continuing long-duration flight. 
All right. Thank you very much. It was great to talk to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the ABC News portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Associated Press. Station, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, Marcia. How do you hear me? Just fine. Greetings, Peggy, uh, from Kennedy Space Center. I thought I'd begin with your extended stay up there. I, I realize you knew about the possibility of a three-month extension the day before you launched, but now that it's reality, do you think it's going to be tough sticking it out that long? No, I don't think it will be. It's, it's a lot of fun. We've got a lot of science going on right now that's very interesting. We've got visiting vehicles coming up. Um, we have another EVA. Uh, I'm, I'm not bored yet, not even close. Um, what do you think is going to be the hardest part of being in space for so long? Um, physiological, um, mental, I, I, or just um, missing some of the niceties of Earth life? I guess probably, you know, it's more mental, you know. I, we have great access uh, via phone, IP phone, and we have uh, video conferences with family uh, a few times a month. And so all of that is really great. But it would be nice, I think, probably that's going to be the thing I look forward to the most is getting home and being able to give everybody a hug. Well, did you have any mixed feelings when they approached you about this, or was it an easy, easy decision to just say, sure, three months more, no problem? It was uh, relatively easy for me. I think the big thing for me was not to get my hopes up that it would happen. Uh, my husband and I talked about having a flexible plan to happiness, uh, that we would be flexibly happy if I came home in June and flexibly happy if I came home in, in September. Because um, anytime you count on something happening for sure, <laughs> it changes. So, so, you know, flexible happiness is a good way to go. It sounds like you've got the key of uh, happiness up there. Um, you know, Easter is just a few days away. I'm just wondering how you and the rest of the crew will be celebrating Easter up there, and maybe is the Easter Bunny going to be dropping by? I don't know. I think we're actually a little short on chocolate right now, but maybe uh, when the next Soyuz crew comes up, we'll get a little more chocolate. <laughs> Toma and I kind of like chocolate. <laughs> You've been lucky to have a French astronaut as your crewmate for all the various things he's been able to provide um, with all the food. You know, I, I understand that cooking is a big deal for you on Earth. Um, tell me, what, what are some of the specialties you've whipped up up there, and what are some of the complications of cooking in space besides uh, lack of ingredients? Actually, the biggest complication is everything floats. So. Finding a mechanism or a way to make something while you can, can can contain it. So, for instance, when you're making space hamburgers, you have to use sauce is important because it's your glue to hold the pieces together while you're building the hamburger. Uh, and so you have to think about how do I hold this all together while I'm putting it together. So you have to think of assembly sequence <laughs> to make sure that everything's going to stay together. And yet, and because we don't have plates or anything like that. Uh, Tortillas are one of my favorite uh, structures because you can you can eat it in your hand, so you have to be able to build it inside a tortilla uh, a lot of times. But we've done apple pies inside of tortillas and with raisins inside, and um, chasing down the raisins is kind of challenging sometimes, but it's fun. We do it as kind of a group event, and that way everybody can help, you know, make it kind of an assembly line thing. The, one of the best things, I think, was uh, we grew some uh, cabbage. It's more it's Chinese cabbage, but it's a little more like a lettuce. And uh, we made uh, a tuna salad with horseradish sauce and put it on the fresh lettuce. That was great. And, and uh, if you could just snap your fingers and you could have a delivery up there from any restaurant here on Earth, what, what would be your order? Maybe some really good Italian with a really, really nice salad. Well, that sounds wonderful. Um, 
you know, you're going to your list of records just keeps growing, Peggy. And what are your thoughts about soon becoming the U.S. record holder for mo most time in space? It's a real honor, privilege uh, to be able to have the record and uh, to represent NASA that way. Well, it seems to me that all that's left for you at this point is maybe a full one-year mission. Uh, would you consider that? And what else entices you? Oh, I, I would definitely love to go to Moon or Mars or uh, some other destination. Uh, space Station's been phenomenal, uh, but I'd like to take some of the next steps. I'm not sure if I'll last that long, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Well, you know, um, the last spacewalk you were on ended up with a uh, cover floating off, and I I'm wondering, have you figured out how that happened yet, and have you spotted that cover up there from a distance in the days since? Actually, uh, the ground team using the cameras, the, the high-definition cameras that are outside, spotted it a couple of times in a couple of orbits, but it was descending rapidly, so it, it, it was never in any uh, risk of hitting the station, thankfully, uh, because it's very lightweight. Uh, we did determine that uh, probably what happened was uh, instead of tethering to a tether strap, we tethered to a ground strap, which was uh, the same type of fabric. And the way we had them folded in half, uh, we had to reach inside to get the tether tether points. And uh, the tether, uh, the grounding strap looked just like the tether points. And so we tethered to something that was only hooked on one end. And so then the tether came off of the, the free end. Uh, so it turns out our... Uh, uh, training hardware wasn't the same. The hardware that was used to develop all the procedures, and um, so it was it was never anything that the ground team had ever run across as a problem, uh, because it was not mocked up exactly the way the flight hardware was, unfortunately. Yeah, I see. So it was just. But it's one of those things you learn from. You, you, so it sounds like it was just a matter of tethering it to the wrong tether, I guess, huh? And that just let it loose. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that was the case. So besides family, what's, what do you miss most so far in your journey? And also, as we wrap up the interview, what's your favorite part about being up there? Well, the, my favorite part for sure is just being able to live here. Living in an environment that is so foreign to the one that you've spent the, you know, your entire life in or almost your entire life um, is actually a very special experience. And I think it's important for us uh, as future spacefaring travelers uh, to recognize that we have to be able to adapt to these different environments uh, in order to do exploration. It's like doing exploration underwater or out here in space. It's, it's always going to take additional challenges. And I think learning about those and figuring out how to overcome them and being able to actually truly live, um, we work here and we've worked here for years, but I think, you know, we're living here. Um, it's been almost, it's over 17 years now, so it's just really uh, a great experience to, to be able to live here. The thing that uh, I guess the, that I don't care for the most is, or I get bored with the easiest, is uh, the lack of variety of the food. Um, that to me is the thing that gets to me and, and some of it has to do with the fact that I can't cook. It's all in a package in a pouch. Well, Peggy, Godspeed, safe travels, um, and good luck. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, ABC News and Associated Press. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications.